I won't repeat everything, or shall I repeat everything? Um, yeah. I was just praising the exhibit that you all worked on, which is um, indeed the key to break the silence around the topic of genocide, working victims and survivors, bringing the voices um, to the surface. This is really, really key. And there is a quote from Stalin that I wanted to mention. Um, and this is the one that says, the death of one person is a tragedy, and the death of millions is a statistic. And he knew exactly what he was talking about. Uh, we all know that. And in our work, this is very often the problem. We have the statistics. We have the number of millions of people who are killed, abused. We don't necessarily have all those personal stories that are, again, key to change the narratives around the issue of genocide. And showing that behind the numbers um, of horrific atrocities, there are human stories and there is pain and suffering, um, that dreams and hopes that, that were shattered, it is indeed key to break the silence. And this is why the exhibits, like the one that, that we visited yesterday, it's so important. And I would love to explore ways how we can bring this exhibit to the UK as well, including to the UK Parliament. Okay, now I have two microphones. This kind of um, exhibits that, that we've seen yesterday is, is, again, key to change the narratives around genocide. And I would like to explore with the team how we can bring this um, exhibit to the UK, including to the UK Parliament. And again, this is because the topic of Burundi, the atrocities in Burundi, have not received much attention in the UK. And I'm not talking only about the 1972 atrocities. I'm not talking about the 1993 atrocities. Even 2018 and what's been happening back then, it has not received enough attention. Although, as I was reflecting yesterday, and I've done some research by a British politician on Burundi, and that was around 2018. And earlier today, I also sent her a message to tell her that I'm attending this conference. Uh, and, and of course, that brought some memories from the research that I did for her. And I asked her why it was so important for her to um, for, for me to do this research for her. And she said that she visited Burundi um, on two occasions and she spoke to victims and survivors. And that was what changed her. And that's what inspired her to, to work on the topic as well. And again, this goes back to the stories that we've seen on the exhibit yesterday. Seeing those messages from victims and survivors speaks to the hearts of people. Statistics will never do that. But unfortunately, in this kind of work that I do, we often rely on statistics and data, thinking that if we talk about the suffering of millions, this is going to move politicians or governments to do something. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And as it is in the case of genocide, the annihilation of people is not the final stage of genocide. The denial of genocide is the final stage of genocide. So this is something, again, to think about. And the fact that people are being silenced or asked not to talk about the experiences, as was mentioned earlier, um, this is something that we always need to keep in mind, why people are not allowed to talk about the experiences, why these stories are not allowed to be mentioned anywhere. I think this is something that should speak to our minds and 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 make us reflect on, on the situation. And I was asked to talk about sexual violence in conflict. I was, talk, uh, I was asked to talk about genocide and situations in several African countries. And by doing so, I would like to cover some of the research that I've been um, doing recently for my book in progress under the working title, Where There Is Genocide, There Is Rape. And in my remarks, of course, I, was, I will focus on conflict with sexual violence, but I will narrow it to um, the case of genocide. And the use of conflict with sexual violence is a pandemic that is yet to be addressed. It continues to be used across all conflicts as a method of choice to wage wars. And currently, there is little, very little hope that the crime will ever be addressed, and let alone prevented. It is a weapon of war that aims to hurt and humiliate, and much more than that. And as we talk about conflict-related sexual violence, we sometimes forget that sexual violence is also used on a mass scale outside of conflict situations. 
And that's the reason, for example, that there's a growing body um, of experts talking about conflict and atrocity related violence, just to cover also the situations that do not fall within the purview of traditionally understood conflicts. And I will not bore you about the differences between that, um, because of course, in my presentation, I'll be focusing specifically on genocide. And genocide is a crime that can be perpetrated whether in conflict on peace times. And that's always uh, something that we need to keep in mind. We don't need a conflict for genocide to be perpetrated. And wh what do I mean when I talk about genocide? Genocide has a very clear legal definition, and the definition is in Article 2 of, of the Genocide Convention. And it refers to acts committed with intent to destroy a protected group, whether national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. And there are certain acts listed in, in Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, how genocide can be brought about. And that includes killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm, bodily or mental harm to the members of the group, deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about the destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So these are the five methods mentioned in Article uh, 2 of the Genocide Convention. And from the list that I just mentioned, it is very clear that it does not necessarily specifically mentions rape and sexual violence, but um, rape and sexual violence is definitely included in Article 2, and that's under Section B and D, causing serious bodily on, or, or mental harm to members of the group or imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. And I will mention, I will comment upon them very briefly. Again, what differentiates genocide from any other crimes is the specific intent to destroy a protected group in whole or in part. Sometimes the methods used will be very similar as in the cases of war crimes or crimes against humanity. But the specific intent is what differentiates genocide from other international crimes. And that was, it was also mentioned earlier today that it is very difficult to prove specific intent. And I agree, it is sometimes being used that, well, we can't really see the specific intent, so we can't be talking about genocide, which is, um, which is not the case. The lack of evidence doesn't mean it's not genocide. It means that we need to ensure that we have more evidence, that we collect, preserve the evidence. And we've seen that in a number of cases of recent years, once the evidence was being collected, um, the clear um, evidence on specific intent was identified. In terms of rape and sexual violence, in terms of sexual violence as methods of genocide, um, the issue has been ignored for a very long time. And it was not until the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda uh, worked on the case of Jean-Paul Akayesu. And that was the first time that um, officially rape was considered as a genocidal act. And Akayesu served as a mayor of, of the Teba commune and was responsible for maintaining law and public, public order in Taba during the atrocities that took place in Rwanda in 1994. And the case of Akayesu sets precedent for the prosecution of uh, crimes of sexual violence in times of genocide. However, unfortunately, unfortunately, subsequent years have not seen this legacy being used in a meaningful way, and definitely not considering the level of uh, sexual violence being used across so many different situations of conflict and outside of conflict situations. And I'll just very briefly mention to the use of sexual violence as one of genocidal methods as um, methods constituting serious bodily and mental harm. And again, the case of Akayesu is, is key. And among others, the tribunal said, and I quote, that sexual violence certainly constitutes inflictions of serious bodily and mental harm on the victims, and are even one of the worst ways of inflicting harm on the victim, 
as he or she suffers both bodily and mental harm. These rapes resulted in physical and psychological destruction of Tutsi women, their families, and their communities. Sexual violence was an integral part of the process of destructions, specifically targeting Tutsi women and specifically contributing to the destruction and to the destruction of the Tutsi group as a whole. So again, this is very much summarizes how sexual violence is used not only against an individual, but also against the whole community. It destroys the whole community. And this is particularly important since rape and sexual violence are often used as a deliberately military strategy for various purposes, including to demoralize an enemy. And notably, rape and sexual violence have a particular impact on rural in traditional communities. And for example, in Rwanda and also Darfur, these practices destroyed family cohesion and social fabric, acting as a second and long-term genocide. And we know from testimonies of soldiers, but also victims and survivors, that rape is used as a calculated and systematic way because it causes such long-term damage to the whole society, let alone to the survivor. And such testimonies, whether from the perpetrators or whether from victims and survivors, help to ensure that we moved away from perceiving rape and sexual violence as a byproduct of war, but, but looking at the use of sexual violence as a method of war and a method to bring about genocide against the community as well. And very briefly on, on the second method to bring about a genocide where we can see very much that the link with sexual violence is Article 2D, which talks about the imposition of measures intended to prevent deaths within a group. Uh, which not only focuses on the ultimate result, that is the reduction of births within the group, but also on the acts leading towards such reduction. And again, the case of Akayesu is, is of importance here because the tribunal indicated that the prohibited acts of imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group should be constructed as sexual mutilation, the practice of sterilization, forced birth control, separation of the sexes, and prohibition of marriages. So again, it's not only the reduction of um, the births within the group per se, but also the several practices that are being used to ensure that, um, that the birth rate um, within the group is also reduced. And there are several several part, parts from, from the judgment in the case of Akayesu that are crucial here. I don't want to um, cite them all. Um, I think I would definitely encourage you to, to read the whole judgment. No pressure. It's, it's not the lightest um, nighttime reading, but um, because it's so central um, to consideration of the use of sexual violence as, as a method of genocide, I think anyone working in this field uh, should um, familiarize, um, be familiar with, 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 with this particular case. Again, rape is not, and sexual violence is not only used as a method of causing a physical and mental harm to women uh, or men, but also is, uh, is the explicit aim of impairing the ability to procreate either via the inflicted trauma or utilizing cultural taboos or by forced impregnation, among others. The list really goes um, on and on. And the majority of cases that I've been working on and uh, that I want to discuss today are, uh, are cases where sexual violence has been used as a genocidal method. Such cases have been on increase over recent years, unfortunately, flourishing on impunity for two of the most neglected atrocities genocide and sexual violence. Where the two collide, impunity appears to be a guarantee. And whenever sexual violence is being perpetrated in cases of genocide, um, we know that the perpetrators will get away with it. That's the legacy of recent years. And um, it's very difficult to say that, and especially because I work with many victims and survivors. But unfortunately, in recent years, we have not seen much hope. And in my presentation, I would like to focus on three cases. Um, I want to talk about the situation in Ethiopia, 
DAFO, and the DRC. And just starting with Ethiopia, in recent years, and especially when we talk about the Tigray War, the use of rape and sexual violence against ethnic Tigrayan women um, has been considered to be a genocidal method to bring about the destruction of the community. Um, there, reportedly, the perpetrators um, committed rape and gang rape um, against women, subsequently mutilated them, having told the victims that a Tigrayan womb should never give birth. This is a quote from an article by Lucy Casa, a wonderful journalist who was forced to leave Ethiopia um, because of the threats that she was facing for her reporting. And we've seen many more uh, reports on the use of sexual violence on a mass scale in, um, in the Tigray war uh, between um, 2020, 2022. And the reports about the situation, the dire situation of women and girls specifically um, in Tigray started circulating shortly after the war began. There were reports from the UN, including um, from the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict, Pramila Patern, who described the severity, the nature, the, the, the level of, of, um, of the use of rape and sexual violence against women and girls. But unfortunately, this have not been addressed. And I remember uh, that was, uh, I believe, the end of 2020 when I was approached as well by um, researchers from Tigray who told me that the situation is, uh, is deteriorating uh, by hour. Um, what can we do or what, what can you do? Um, and of course, I'm not a politician. Um, I'm not at the UN, so theoretically my options are very much limited. But what we offered was that we can shine some light on the situation. And one of the first steps was that we brought some scholars, some um, representatives of victims and survivors to come to talk to politicians in the UK to explain what is happening to the community. At the time, of course, we were still in lockdown. And so we organized one of the sessions online, um, but we made sure that a transcript was then also sent to politicians. We asked them to raise questions in terms of what the UK government is going to do in response to the growing number of reports on the use of sexual violence against Tigrayan women. And we tried this way to, of course, engage the government. Unfortunately, they have not been, um, we, we have not received a proper response to, to the situation. Uh, for a very long time. Uh, we asked the government also to do um, risk assessment or assessment of the serious risk of genocide in the case. Um, but the UK government decided not to do it until um, spring 2022. So as you can imagine, that was a few months just before the end of, not the end of the conflict, but before the agreement in Pretoria that was signed, um, that was meant to end hostilities, but it did not. And as we continue monitoring the situation, and, and again, just after the Pretoria Agreement from November 2022, there were several other reports on the use of sexual violence. And I just wanted to briefly mention one research from Physicians for Human Rights, which is a wonderful organization of, of medical professionals working with victims um, and survivors of conflict-related sexual violence, and who produce regular reports on the situation. And among the reviewed data by them, um, they identified that there were 169 incidents of conflict-related sexual violence before signing the agreement in November 2022, 128 incidents just after signing the agreement in November 2022. And based on the data, they also concluded that the scale and nature of those vi violations have not materially changed since the peace agreement. They call it peace agreement, but again, we know that it's not a peace agreement, it's a cessation of hostilities agreement. Um, there was no material change, except for the notable fact that 95% of conflict-related sexual violence experienced by children and, and under 18 occurred following signing of that agreement. So that was the main change, that before the agreement, um, um, majority of victim survivors were over 18, after majority of them were under the age of 18. So that's not really a, a, a difference and not something that we would expect after a cessation of hostilities agreement. 
And again, even after the um, signing that agreement, um, there were still Eritrean troops in Tigray region. They're still there and they're, they're not moving anywhere from what we, um, what we know. And hostilities continued. Uh, sometimes um, some scholars and some um, human rights defenders from the region said that um, maybe the bullets stopped, but violence continues uh, to, this, to, to this day. And last year, as, as you may know, um, the group of experts, a group of experts that was established by the UN to monitor the situation in, uh, in Ethiopia, um, their mandate was to expire. Uh, in September last year. And as we, we were watching that, there was not enough political will to actually extend the mandate of that group. We also did, um, it's called the Tigray Inquiry in the UK Parliament, which included, um, of course, desk research, but also oral hearings with victims and survivors, with organizations working with victims and survivors. And we wanted to, um, to use this evidence and to make sure that the UN or member states um, at the Human Rights Council engage and make sure that they extend the mandate to make sure that there is an independent body that can monitor the situation um, for a longer period of time. Two years of this mechanism in place is not enough, especially because we did not see any difference, including after that um, 2022 Pretoria Agreement. There was no difference, but nonetheless, there was not enough political will among states to extend the mandate, and the man mandate ceased to exist. Um, and from what we know, the situation continues to be the same as it was before. There is no significant change. From this very um, depressing um, presentation on the situation in Ethiopia, I'll move to Darfur, so I don't have better news in relation to Darfur either. Um, in relation to Darfur, of course, last year in 2023, we were marking 20 years after the genocide of 2003. And as we were preparing to mark the anniversary, uh, we always do, we mark such um, significant dates uh, to remember victims and survivors, to think or uh, reflect what's been happening over the years. And as we were preparing to mark the date, we realized that there is an increase um, number of, of attacks against Darfurians. There is an increased number of, of cases of rape and sexual violence. So what is happening? Why are we seeing this increase of violence? And at the same time, we were hearing from, from government officials that everything is fine. Um, the transitional justice plan is there and we are meeting the deadlines. Everything will be great. But we didn't take it as the final answer and we decided to also look into the situation with a very similar approach, an inquiry to, to conduct some research, to explore what is already being reported on, what else we need to identify. And we also spoke to many victims and survivors. Uh, we spoke to rep their representatives and um, we issued a report raising early warning signs and risk factors. And we said that the situation is dire and if nothing is done, we'll see yet another genocide, we'll see yet another wave of atrocity crimes against the Furians. And as we were publishing this report, that's when the situation in Khartoum exploded. Because of that, the report received a lot of government attention because they seemed to be surprised um, about the deterioration, deteriorating situation in uh, Darfur and, and Sudan. We were not. We, we've done our work, we, we've done our research, we knew that bad things will happen if we don't act. But again, um, the situation took the UK government by surprise. And we tried to engage again with our recommendations, what needs to happen. Um, initially, there was very positive response in terms of, okay, yes, we need, uh, we need some oversight, we need monitoring, um, but it didn't last very long. And especially because the way it works, media moves from one situation to another very, very quickly, and so the attention of, of governments as well. And just a few months after our report, there were several reports on the situation, uh, on the use of rape and sexual violence, again, reported by the UN on a mass scale with um, significant number of, 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 of cases reported on a daily basis. 
And there is um, also one research that I wanted to, uh, to mention to you from Physicians for Human Rights. Um, and that was in relation to how many cases they, they, were, they were seeing of, of horrific atrocities. Um, and as they were also reporting um, the situation, the UN um, expert, uh, Reem Al-Sam, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls, published also a warning about um, the horrific widespread use of rape and sexual violence against women and girls. And um, just wanted to very briefly mention, because it was also a, a massive coincidence, um, I told you about the work that we've been doing on, um, on Tigray and a Tigray inquiry, and I mentioned to you briefly also the Darfur inquiry that we've done last year. And one of the wonderful human rights defenders who, was, uh, who herself is from Ethiopia and who helped us also with the, um, the Tigray inquiry, she... She brought lots of stories from, from the region. She's been working with uh, Tigrayan women who were in uh, refugee camps in Sudan. And she was actually at some point based in Sudan as well, in one of the camps, um, collecting the data from victims and survivors, uh, making sure that it is documented, uh, that it can be sent to various um, international bodies. As the situation in Khartoum exploded, she was actually in Sudan. And she mentioned that um, it was mind-boggling to be with victims and survivors who just escaped Ethiopia, who were abused, who suffered horrific atrocities. And there were there was yet another conflict that they had then to flee from, um, which was something for them unimaginable, because they thought that maybe in Sudan, in that camp, they will be safe. But at the time, there were also attacks um, on, on people in camps, and, and unfortunately, they had to flee yet again. So it just shows you how victims and survivors are sometimes subjected to yet another atrocity in a different place. If we don't address one situation and it spreads it and, and impunity begets further crime. That's, that's very clear, I think, from, from the research that we've been doing, the research that many other, uh, other people and organizations have been doing. And the next situation I want to talk to you about is the situation in the DRC. Um, the situation in the DRC, of course, we know that there is the use of rape and sexual violence on a mass scale that continues to this day. Um, but I, I, I'm still working on whether it can be classified as, as genocide. I, I think there are certain challenges in terms of the group identity and, and whether we can classify um, the targeted groups or the targeted individuals as within one of the protected groups. Technical, I know it's just technical issue, but unfortunately for the purposes of the definition of genocide, it is very, very important. But I wanted to talk to you about the DRC um, because I had a conversation with Dr. Mukwege. And Dr. Mukwege, of course, he's an incredible, incredible expert who has been working with victims and survivors for years. And um, I don't remember the exact number of, of women that he um, helped. I think it was 40,000. Of victims of conflict-related sexual violence and he came to parliament last year and he spoke to us and he we gave him our book uh, by our i mean uh, a book that i have written with lord alton of liverpool and he looked uh, through the book and he said okay drc is not here why it's not here we said well we are not sure whether we can include it here because um the difference between the legal definition of genocide and crimes against humanity um you can imagine he was not very happy with that um but we started thinking about it and, and of course trying to see how the use of rape and sexual violence has been used to um, destroy the group in whole or in part. And so this is a case that I'm still sitting on, um, but I wanted to mention it because it's such a different or different level of atrocities against women. And the DRC is often considered to be the capital of rape in the world. And uh, rape is being used there as a method of war, but also a method of criminality. And uh, be became so common that organizations working with victims and survivors with the community say that there is no woman in the DRC who has not been raped. Not my words, it's, these are the words from, from organizations working with victims and survivors. 
And the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war in the DRC, of course, has a very long history. But unfortunately, um, just even looking at recent years, there have been increased number of, of such cases. And there was one data I wanted to read to you uh, from, from the UN. Um, in 2020, the UN documented 1,053 cases of conflict-related sexual violence, affecting 675 women, 350, six, uh, 370 girls, three men, and five boys. Again, I'm telling you only statistics. Be behind every number, there's a horrific story of pain and suffering. And please keep those numbers, because then I will tell you something else. Then I think it will put it also in perspective. And then if we look at more recent years, um, April 2023, we've seen an increase in, in such cases um, um, in, in the DRC. And Doctors Without Borders documented that within two weeks only, they documented 674 cases of sexual violence. In two weeks, 674 cases. It means on average, 48 victims, survivors per day, 48 per day, victims and survivors needing assistance. And this is very, very key. The numbers that I just gave you is of victims and survivors who sought medical assistance. And Dr. Mokwega often says that women in the DRC, they don't seek medical assistance unless it is medically necessary. So for example, they, they are bleeding and they cannot stop it. Uh, they need inter medical intervention. So they don't report rape and sexual violence because it occurs. They only report it when it's, the situation is so dire, they need urgent medical assistance. They, they can't help themselves. So just to keep that in mind, the numbers, massive as it is, again, it is not, it's just a tip of, of the iceberg. It is not the actual number of victims and survivors. So these are words from Dr. Mokwege that I think I, I kept um, in my mind. And I think, I think those numbers and, and also the messages from Dr. Mokwege keep haunting me. And um, what we promised is that this year we will do also an inquiry into the situation in, in the DRC. And it will look into everything what was, has been done or not to this day in terms of justice and accountability for victims and survivors, why we have not seen more being done to address the situation and how we can engage, especially considering a very difficult security situation um, in the country, um, but also the, the large numbers of victims and survivors that require attention. And I just wanted to very briefly mention that in the case of the DRC, um, we have not seen many um, recent legal steps taken to address the atrocities, but there was a very interesting development in the UK. And for, for the International Day on Elimina for Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict, the, um, the UK sanctioned two um, former leaders for their involvement in um, sexual violence in the UK. And they received um, sanctions such as freezing orders, travel bans, and similar sanctions were also issued by, um, by, the, uh, by the European Union. And it doesn't mean much. It's not necessarily the traditional understanding of justice and accountability, but it is a step where nothing else has been done or nothing else is possible. Um, individual sanctions against in, um, individual perpetrators. Um, one tool in the toolbox that we have and that we should be using more often, and again, especially if we don't see justice and accountability done in any other way. And I mentioned at the very beginning that I did do some research on the situation in Burundi and, and I was just looking through some of the papers that I, um, that I produced for, for that one wonderful uh, politician and I will share her details later on. Um, but again, the use of uh, sexual violence was among um, some of the data that, that are collected back then. And we have seen very little in terms of, okay, what has been done to address it? Um, and from yesterday's conversation, we also briefly covered Nigeria. And this is also a case that is very close to my heart. And I've done research on the situation of women and girls, especially the targeting by Boko Haram, but also Fulani um, militia. 
um, but I don't want to take too much time because I wanted to hopefully mention some positive um, aspects or something to keep uh, to keep the hope. Um, and of course, again, I, I, I mentioned to you three cases um, where we've seen horrific um, level of, of, of the use of rape and sexual violence where we can make the argument, oh, it is very clear that those atrocities uh, meet the legal definition of genocide, and then, of course, crimes against humanity. But in terms of legal uh, steps taken to address them, we have not seen much, whether to collect the atrocities, whether to bring proceedings against the perpetrators, to, to, to stop the atrocities as well. Unfortunately, in all those cases, the atrocities are, are ongoing. We hear very little about them. There is zero media focus on the situations. Uh, but unfortunately, that's how um, the world works um, at this stage. And there's a lot that can be done um, in terms of collecting the, the evidence. And I'm currently involved in a project, not, um, not in those situations. It is a project in Ukraine, but it's on documenting uh, conflict related sexual violence and actually working with documenters to train them how to do it uh, to make sure that they are aware of of the, those issues. And even if they report other atrocities that they're mindful that um, there may be, among the victims and survivors that they meet, there may be victims of conflict with sexual violence. What does it mean? And what does it mean also for the documenting process uh, or the assistance that they can need to offer and so on? Um, so there are many similar initiatives in other cases, and we need to make sure that we work more on, on such projects. Um, I've seen wonderful projects as well from a number of universities, and I'll mention Toronto University. Um, Toronto University established a, a wonderful database, and, and that was established for the situation in Cameroon. And that was a database to collect and preserve evidence of the atrocities, especially because the UN and international institutions were not looking into the situation. So they managed to establish a, a secure database where individuals can submit information of human rights violations. They can, of course, then do their due diligence and, and um, research it further and, and start collecting this data um, this way. And of course, if data is collected the right way, it can be used in future prosecutions. We don't know when it's going to happen, when there will be a possibility of this sort. But nonetheless, if we don't preserve the evidence now, there is no hope for, future, uh, for, for justice in the future. So preservation of evidence is key. And this is, again, crucial to fight the ongoing impunity because impunity will get further crime and will send also the outrageous message to the perpetrators that they can get away with rape, that they can get away with genocide. And I think if we have any respect to the duties of the Genocide Convention is, is to prove them wrong, but we are not doing it yet. And again, I mentioned that I'm very disillusioned about the state of the world as it is, um, but I wanted to share with you a few initiatives that um, hopefully, or will hopefully bring about change um, in the way we address the issue of genocide, hopefully prevent genocide. But if we can't prevent, then of course, ensure better ways to, to prosecute the perpetrators. And among them are two bills that we have in the House of Lords right now in the UK. One is called the Genocide Prevention and Responses Bill. And the second is called Genocide Determination Bill. Genocide Prevention and Response Bill is a bill that is very similar to something what you have in the US, uh, which is the Ali Wiesel Act which requires uh, the State Department in this case to monitor early warning signs of atrocity crimes around the world and um, identify ways to address them. On top of that, the State Department is also required to report on an annual basis which situations they consider as atrocity situations that require attention and exact steps that have taken to, to address them. And this Ellie Wiesel reporting is, is a very important piece of, um, um, of work done in, in the US. We don't have anything similar in the UK. We don't have any mechanism to monitor early warning signs, which is a massive failure, especially um, in relation to the duty to prevent genocide. 
And this bill is um, is meant to to address it and make sure that we have a mechanism to monitor early warning signs, um, and also um, a mechanism requiring um, the ministers to identify how we are going to address those situations. It also requires to ensure that people working in embassies around the world have training on atrocity prevention, have training on identifying early warning signs when they see some kind of evidence. Um, of, of targeting um, of communities because of their religion or ethnicity or race, this is then, uh, it should trigger alerts. Uh, it doesn't happen, but uh, that's the reason we need training for, for individuals dealing with such evidence. And again, this is being done in the US, um, not in the UK at this stage. The other, the genocide determination bill is slightly different. It deals with UK long-standing policy of not recognizing atrocities as genocide and waiting for a court to do that. So for example, the Burundi 1972 is not recognized as genocide by the UK government. The one from 1993 also not. And there are several other situations that are not recognized um, as genocide. Darfur 2003 is not recognized as genocide uh, by the UK government. Why? Because there have been no court that actually considered the evidence and formally recognized the atrocities as genocide. So currently the UK government recognizes only five cases of genocide, um, including most recently uh, the, the UK government recognized the uh, genocide against the Yazidis as, as, as genocide. And that was following um, three or four verdicts from German courts that the atrocities amount to the crime of genocide. But unfortunately, other situations um, still wait for the recognition. And this bill aims to empower victims and survivors or their representatives to come forward and to apply to the court to have a formal determination of the atrocities as genocide. The court will then consider the evidence available and make a formal determination. And this is very much to address the fact that in many cases, we don't have courts that would deal with the, the issue. For example, the situation of the Yazidis before the German courts that took um, those cases, there was no international court that would have jurisdiction to deal with the issue. ICC, International Criminal Court, doesn't have jurisdiction because Syria and Iraq are not member states. Um, the ICJ, of course, with the ICJ, uh, it's, it's, it's also complicated. It has to be a state bringing proceedings and there was no interest to bring proceedings against um, Iraq. To this day, also the, the, uh, no state is willing to bring proceedings against Syria. Um, this, this, this is not a case that that this in the public domain and the interest involved. So unfortunately, we we have not seen any movement there. And and this was it was only the German courts that used the principle of universal jurisdiction and prosecuted the perpetrators for international crimes such as genocide and crimes against humanity. But it is not being done in all cases. It's, it's, sometimes it's a matter of coincidence or really an exception. Justice and accountability is an exception. It's not a norm. Impunity is the norm. Um, but I think, well, it, I, was, I was getting very positive with those bills before I started telling you that impunity is the norm. So I decided that maybe it's better if I stop here before I, I, I will get back to my very presenting the world as a very dark place. And um, I will share information about those two bills because this is something that could be replicated in other places. Focus on prevention, focus on determination, recognition of the atrocities for what they are. And then of course, justice and accountability that should follow. But this is something that could be replicated in other places and step-by-step, step, hopefully we can work towards change that is urgently needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation. Give her another round of applause.
Okay, what is the um, the position of the International Court of Justice? Of course, uh, we've seen proceedings being brought by uh, South Africa um, some months ago, and, and just a couple of weeks ago, and there was a decision, and the court issued provisional measures. Um, and the provisional measures, um, th there were several, uh, several of them, and I think um, some of them were already discussed um, earlier, but... Um, Ultimately, of course, it is to make sure that, among others, no further atrocities are being perpetrated and so on. So that's uh, that's something that was already ordered um, in the provisional measures some, some weeks ago. And then, either it was yesterday or two days ago, um, South Africa um, went back to the ICJ and asked um, to um, also consider the issue of starvation. So again, the procedure, the way it works, then there will be a hearing, and then uh, the ICJ will consider whether additional provisional measures are needed. In the meantime, as well, Nicaragua uh, brought proceedings against Germany, um, also in relation to the case of, of um, um, well, German support to Israel. And um, at this stage, we still don't know what's going to happen with, with, with that case. Um, it was a very interesting one because Nicaragua is committing atrocity crimes in Nicaragua right now. Uh, from my end, I, I work now on a Nicaragua inquiry, which is very much also collecting evidence of what is happening in Nicaragua, the exile of, of many, many people. And the fact that Nicaragua recognizes the ICJ um, is, is very helpful because we would like to bring proceedings um, against Nicaragua for, for the violations of, of human rights. So. It, we don't know at this stage what's going to happen. It's a different one. But right now, we have so many cases of genocide before ICJ. Um, and of course, uh, we have one against Israel. We have one um, now against Germany. Um, there is one against Myanmar, um, Azerbaijan, um, uh, Ukraine, Russia. Um, so there are so many cases that we, I think, at some point, um, we should have a lot of additional information in terms of how to understand our obligations under the Genocide Convention. There should be much more, because for now we've been relying on the judgment from 2007 that was very clear in terms of when the duty to, pre uh, to, to prevent genocide is to be triggered. Uh, but nonetheless, for now, those obligations have been ignored and uh, states have been waiting for genocide to be full-blown, to see bodies on the street, to actually consider it or start considering it as genocide. But, for example, the 2007 judgment is very clear. It's the serious risk of genocide that is the trigger. So um, we'll see what's going to happen with, with the additional proceedings being brought by South Africa. We'll see what's going to happen with the Nicaraguan case. Um, but for now, there is one order for provisional measures. Um, that I think it was not welcomed um, in Israel, from what I remember. But um, it's an order of provisional measures, so um, it should be respected. Work yes, right here. I could, I probably need a microphone. Thank you. Um. Oh, sorry, scared myself. Um. So we have seen throughout history that we typically recognize genocide after it's happened, and from my understanding of Article Two. As soon as you call it a genocide, there's supposed to be international action or, you know, aid and everything. Can we look at the cases of ICJ and begin to think that we are on the right track of making genocide a term we can apply to conflicts in the current day instead of making it a term you can only apply to conflicts in history or in the past? That's that's a great question. And and unfortunately, Article 1, the duty to prevent genocide, is not to be triggered when we see full-blown genocide, not at all. Otherwise, we can't even talk about prevention. Prevention is about acting upon early warning signs and risk factors. And the, indeed, that's precisely what the judgment from 2007 in the case of Bosnia says. And um, I think it's, it's paragraph 430 that says that the duty to prevent genocide arises at the instant 
a state learns or should normally have learned of a serious risk of genocide. So again, it's not genocide. We don't need a core determination of genocide or UN recognizing it as genocide. It's the serious risk of genocide. And that's the reason we need to put more pressure on, on ensuring that states have mechanisms that will enable them to, um, to identify early warning signs and risk factors. I mentioned to you uh, earlier that, for example, the, the US uh, has the Ali Wiesel Act that requires it to monitor early warning signs, but other states don't have it. I mean, the UK doesn't have such a mechanism. So theoretically, the UK could rely on the argument, oh, we, we didn't know, we didn't see the early warning signs. We, oh, obviously, we don't monitor them, but um, it doesn't matter. We didn't see it coming. That's what we heard in, in the case of Darfur from last year. So this is the problem. It is not, um, we don't need to wait for formal determination of the atrocities as genocide. We need to act at the serious risk of genocide. Otherwise, we are not talking about prevention, just historic recognition of the atrocities, as it was done, for example, in the case of Armenia some months ago. US re recognized the atrocities as genocide. Great, but with contemporary cases of genocide, we need to act earlier. We need th That's the only way how we can prevent pain and suffering of the people who are being targeted, of the whole communities being targeted. Dealing with post-genocide trauma is never going to uh, to solve the issue, um, because the, the pain and suffering was already caused. We need to do better and prevention, that means acting upon early warning signs, risk factors, is the only way forward. Otherwise, we are just misunderstanding what Article 1 is all about. One absolute final question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for a brilliant uh, presentation. I am Dr. Olivier Kamanzi. Uh, you mentioned so many countries, and also you mentioned about Dr. Denis Mukwege, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate from uh, East DRC. Uh, you may also, you are talking about you can qualify genocide when it has happened already. In east of Congo, over 10 million people have been killed, including those women, raped women you mentioned. When are we going to qualify as a genocide? Genocide has happened already. This is my first question. My second question is, uh, how can we stop genocide happening when we know uh, the perpetrators, those who trigger to uh, genocide to happen are the same people who commit genocide and they're also the one who control the whole world. How the cycle of violence and genocide will stop? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much for, uh, for the two questions against the rules, but it's fine. We'll let it slide this time. Um, in terms of when will we recognize the genocide in the DRC? Who recognizes genocides? It could be done by the UN, it could be done by states, it could be done by courts, of course, and in each case, the procedure of engaging them is very, very different. Um, will the UN recognize the atrocities as genocide? I think the UN focus on the DRC is currently negligent. Um, so unlikely that the UN is going to recognize it. States, if you look at states around the world that recognize atrocities as genocide, there are only few. US is one of them. So the, the US recognizes more genocides than any other um, state in the world. Um, recognize, for example, the Rohingya, uh, the, the Rohingya genocide, the Yazidi genocide, the Uyghur genocide. Um, but unfortunately, from what I know, there is currently no situation and no ongoing consideration of the situation in the DRC as genocide. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. In order for this to happen, the State Department will have to be chased with, with, with evidence for them to actually take notice and consider it. But I think in terms of, again, um, engaging on the situation, I have not seen enough action for the State Department to, to act upon. And then in terms of um, courts, 
Well, the, the ICC is looking into the situation in the DRC. Um, so one option would be to, and that could be done by any organization collecting the evidence, to submit Article 15 submissions to the ICC. That includes evidence of some of the atrocities. You can include also arguments why the issue of genocide has to be considered and so on. This can be done by, by anyone with relevant information. And indeed, uh, we promise also Dr. Mukwege that we'll do a Article 15 submission in relation to the use of rape and sexual violence. Um, I've done similar submissions in the past in the case of Nigeria. Um, and indeed, Boko Haram is considered one of the cases. Um, but Fulani Herzman, the, the submission was, was ignored. And, and then, theoretically, an adoption would be, for example, proceeding with domestic courts and have also formal determination of, of, of the atrocities as genocide. Um, it's definitely much more difficult. It has to be against individuals. The way it works in Argentina is slightly different, and it could be possible, for example, to have Argentine courts involved. We are currently working on one case against um, genocide against the Uyghurs there. We are considering other cases as well. And I think Argentina, Argentine courts would be one way forward to have a formal determination of, of genocide. Um, but the options are limited uh, in terms of who makes the decisions, whether it's genocide, who makes the formal determinations of their trust as genocide that count or that have authority and that can make a difference. It's a very difficult, um, unfortunately. And I can mention to you a number of cases um, how the struggle to have the atrocities to be recognized as genocide um, um, developed or how they were trying to address it. Um, I can tell you about the situation of the Yazidis, how it progressed as well, although there have been some recognition there, how it worked in the, the case of the Rohingyas. Each case is different, but in each case, there are different ways of engaging um, domestic and international bodies on, on the topic. And in terms of prevention, um, understanding that the perpetrators are not going to stop until somebody stops them. And how to break the silence. Um, uh, again, nothing is going to happen until international bodies, states are engaged. In some cases, the way it worked was that states came together. Um, there was a collaboration between them to engage um, the perpetrators um, with certain benefits. Um, if you stop the atrocities, we'll do trade. If you stop the atrocities, we will have proper um, diplomatic dialogue and, um, and so on. But that's definitely a very, very difficult one. Um, the way it works, for example, or it worked with, with China when the atrocities against Uyghurs were being perpetrated. Um, trade was one of um, the carrots. But unfortunately, that doesn't apply in, in every case. And we need more um, um, awareness raising about the situations that require attention. We need more media attention. We need more communities around the world being involved and raising it with their politicians. What we, for example, very often say in the UK, um, that we, we say to, to people in various constituencies, write to your MP, write to your representative, ask them to raise the situation with the government. Um, so that's one way how we can engage the broader um, public on the topic, but until there is actually public engagement, nothing is going to be done or the governments are not going to act. We, we've seen that, for example, in the case of the Yazidis, there was not, the, the general public wasn't very engaged and it was a struggle to engage politicians to, to, to care. There were few very much involved, but it was a struggle. In the case of Uyghurs, the general public was very much engaged and we've, see, we've seen much better engagement from politicians and then government's responses. But it's it's a very difficult question, and there is no one answer for, for it. But there are various ways how we can make smaller or bigger steps and try to be a part of 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 of, of the whole um, attempt to address atrocity crimes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
very much to paraphrase Napoleon from Animal Farm. All genocides are equal, but some are more noticed than others. Right? Um, and perhaps it's a working theme for our um, conference next year. We end on this note and uh, we move to our next uh, session.